Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is the Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection. Uh, today I'm going to use my handy globe here to help explain what the importance of a chronometer is. Now you have lines going north and south. These are called longitudinal lines and then you have lines going east and west. And the middle one right in the middle is called uh, the equator and this is sort of the the middle of the of the earth north and south now north and west you have something that's called the prime meridian and the prime meridian uh, goes through greenwich england and that was they said okay well uh let's see what we can do for the de for deciding where we are east and west and so we'll name one of these longitudinal lines the prime meridian and so we'll make measurements to the east and west of that prime meridian. Now, with the Earth, there's 365 degrees around the Earth. And so, uh, what you can do, they decided, well, what we'll do is we'll divide it by 24 hours. And every hour uh, to either to the east or west from the prime meridian could be measured in, in terms of a location. So, um, the what they needed though was this the north and south the latitudes could be uh, determined by a sextant with a uh, measuring the sun's position from the horizon and as you went north or south uh, you could tell how far you were by the position of the sun but east and west was a problem and this is why they developed the concept of the prime meridian and so if you were an hour to the west of it, uh, this would you'd add an you'd add a 15 degrees to it, and if you were an hour to the right, you'd subtract that. Okay, so um, the the problem was is that you needed an exact time. Now, if you look at the longitudinal lines, you can see that they converge at the poles. At the North Pole, they all become together, and so right at the North Pole, you could take a stick and draw a circle around it and you'd have all, all, all of the um, 24 uh, different, I guess you'd call them, uh, longitudinal uh, positions. Okay, so uh, for North and South, so if you have the latitude and then you knew the time by, and you'd know how far, how far North you were, and so you could use the, uh, they'd provide a table for you, is that at certain times, and if, you were, and if your latitude is this far north, this is where you were. The big problem was, was getting a clock <laughs> that was uh, accurate enough so you wouldn't get lost. And uh, some of the early clocks, they did have maritime clocks before uh, the, what was uh, John Harrison's uh, marine chronometer uh, but they weren't quite as good. And so, if, you know, you could just be off just a little and be way off. Uh, by the way, too, you may have, if you've ever heard a reference to a, um, a longitude and latitude, especially longitude, they'll say you're, um, let's say, uh, 150 degrees west of the prime longitude, but they'll say 115 plus 20 minutes plus 15 seconds. And so it, this is, they're all, they're all referencing where their position is east and west by using minutes and seconds. Okay, so, so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some chronometers. Now, uh, one of the categories that, uh, that they have in the Grand Prix Orologie is for chronometers. Uh, they've only had it for the last few years. They've used to be the uh, tourbillon one because tourbillons are considered to be make the watch uh, more accurate and <laughs> so, so forth so let's take a look at uh, some of the ones uh the recent ones now last year's winner was called the uh, chronometry ferdinand berthold fb2 re2 okay and in order to make it more accurate it would, they had this thing called a Fuzzy and chain. And what that would do, the chain would be set up so that as the spring unwound, they, it was, they were able to keep it 
using the chain and fusi to, I mean the fusi and chain, to keep it from either slowing down or, or speeding up. Uh, now they also, uh, what the, the, the chronomets uh, Fernand Bertho did was to have a remontoir egalité. And what this is, is a little thing that would go and then rewind uh, every so many seconds or minutes so that you, you'd have one thing, the, the main spring would unwind it and then these little springs would keep it from uh, having a consistent power. And that was the way one, and that's why that one would enter that into a, a chronomat uh, category. Now, uh, the year before also, uh, Ferdinand Berthold also won uh, with what was called the carbonized steel regulator. Now this is a, what a regulator is, is simply a watch that has a separate uh, dial area or subdial for all of the indicators. And again, uh, what, what they did is that they combined a fusi and chain, but this time they used a tourbillon. Now here was something really interesting. They mentioned that this particular watch was certified by COSC. We'll talk about that a little later, but uh, that is an official certification process. Okay, so that's another way they, they, they kept everything accurate was using the Fusian chain. Now, uh, the Brevet Nadeau eccentricity of this was another uh, one they had. And by the way, too, most of these, if not all of them, are manual wound. And they, I don't think any of them are over uh, three hertz. They're either two and a half or three hertz. They use a lower one. Uh, this one uses two and a half hertz, 18,000 VPH. And what it, what it has in it, this, the whole notion of eccentricity is that it, it has an escapement to give what they call a direct impulse. And it's, it has a 25 micron thick uh, spring and an eccentric small plate so that there's no shock can mess up the operation. Shock absorbers, lower, um, lower uh, frequency rates, provide a more stable uh, kind of environment. And so when you, if, if the watch gets knocked, it can, it can regain its uh, sort of its uh, where it needs to be quicker with a lower uh, frequency on that. Now, another one that we talked about a great deal uh, in order to, to have this consistency here, again, you have uh, manual wind, winding, mechanical, it's three Hertz. And uh, there's, there's another little uh, video that I've done on this recently, and uh, there's a reference for it up there. Uh, but this one has dual barrels, uh, dual wheel, wheel trains, dual rim and toit, and dual escapements. So what, what this is called a direct escapement uh, for a direct impulse. And so this is another way that was used to try to have this consistency. By the way, too, all of these watches were, uh, that I'm showing you were either finalists uh, or winners in the Grand Prix uh, for chronometers. Now, uh, this last one is, is one, this is by uh, David Kando. Uh, it's called the Half Hunter. Now, what he has, and I think a lot of people have, have recognized this, that tourbillons were originally designed for pocket watches. And pocket watches are going to stay pretty much in the same position, whereas wrist watches are going to go all over the place. And so what David uh, Kando came up with was a, what he called a flying tourbillon and that would create a continual change in position as a person moved. And so this was how he was, uh, went to achieve the um, consistent uh, rate of time and so forth. Now, he, here's the thing about the having something as a chronometer. 
And there's this is some this is a Swiss thing, and they decided I don't know how many years ago, not too many actually, that you know we need some kind of standards that we can certify this watch does meet the chronometer standards. And so they came up with this thing called the COSC, and I'm going to mispronounce it, so bear with me. The control, the official Swiss control of chronometers, that would be the English translation. And so if a, if a watch has the COSC uh, certification, then it's considered to be uh, a true chronometer. Uh, now, Omega has another one that they use called Metas. And they have their certification for chronometer. And so there's there's more than one. There's one in, in Germany. There's one in um, Fluier called Quality Fluier, which is sort of works like a combination of a Geneva seal and a COSC. So there's more than one. Now, here's something else. Here are a couple watches that you're not supposed to use the term chronometer or uh, chronomet on your watch unless it's been certified. But some watch companies do it. Uh, two uh, that I know of are um, FP Journe. Here's my, this is called a chronomet surveying. And what FP Journe says, look, he says our standards are equally as high as yours. And I think he also implied he doesn't want <laughs> CUSC monkeying with his watches. And so on the back here, it says uh, Chronomet Surveying. You can see it in the picture too. Now here's this thing, it's got uh, parallel dual barrels and has the, the kinds of, the level of quality of in building it. They just say, well, we don't, we don't need it. Uh, other ones, uh, this Vassaron Constantin, now this doesn't say chronometer or anything on it, but it does have something called the Geneva Seal. And the Geneva Seal says this thing is, you know, really great quality. And it keeps, you know, as far as I can say, it keeps excellent time, but it's not certified as a chronometer. So even, even with a Geneva Seal, here's another one with a Geneva Seal. Uh, this one doesn't call itself a chronometer either. This is a, a Roger Dubuis Easy Diver. This watch is incredibly accurate, one of my very, very favorite. And again, uh, this one, while it has a Geneva seal, it doesn't have the COSC. Um, here's my most accurate watch, is my Harbring 2 Felix. It's called the Felix, nothing about chronometer. And it is amazingly accurate but it's not COSC certified. I, they don't bother with it. And it's sort of an interesting thing. Um, Rajip Rajipi is a guy who makes these incredible watches. By the way, too, a lot of these watches are just crazy expensive. I think that uh, Rajip uh, Rajipi's, uh, his are something like, um, I think they start around 100,000. <laughs> and uh, whereas FP Journey, this one used to be, I think, in around the mid 20,000, something in there, and now they're up to 50, 60,000 because they, I mean, this is in the used market. I don't know what they, uh, I don't know anybody who's got one new lately because they can't keep up with the demand. The, uh, the ones like this that are called uh, Chronomat Blue, which used to be the entry level, uh, now are over $100,000, even though originally they were in the low 20s. It's sort of crazy, and so on says, well, the COSC <laughs> certifies. Well, we don't need no stinking certification. Uh, what Rajap Rajapi does is sort of very interesting. Now his his are I think it's, this watch is like seventy eighty thousand dollars, something crazy like that. And he says, "Look, guys, you want it to be uh, certified as a chronometer? Fine. Uh, we're going to charge a little more, and we're going to send it to Basson Combe in France." which has an observatory. And to me, that's those are the ones that are the most important because what an observatory does, it checks the watch against the uh, astronomical positions of planets and stars and the moon and the sun and so forth. Now that is what chronometers were originally developed for. And so you're, 
so something by the Basom Colm Observatory, I think there's one in Germany too, and I think that the CUSC and Metas both also have a, an observatory. They can use an atomic clock if they want to, I mean, these days, and it's very, very accurate. Okay, uh, let me know what you think about that. Uh, if you have a chronometer, that's great. If you have a Rolex, all Rolexes have are uh, considered to be chronometers because they have COSC. Other ones like like mine, they, they don't say COSC, but, but the bakers think they are. And this is an invitation to subscribe if you like it. Until next time, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Art Society, the Art and Science of Watts Collection.